Perrin Beatty, good to see you again. First Great to of be all. here. Let me, let me start by getting your reaction to uh, the Canada-Mexico news, which is that, uh, that uh, Canada is now going to lift its visa requirements for Mexico uh, by December 1st. In return, the Mexicans are uh, lifting the remaining restrictions on imports of Canadian beef. Let's start there with, with the visa requirements. Uh, are you happy to see those eliminated? I am. It's been a real irritant in the bilateral relationship. When I talk to officials, they tell me that it has not been an issue in terms of the need to stem the, the flow of people coming in for some time. And as a result, then, it's good to get rid of that. The, there is, there was, has been concern expressed by bureaucrats in, in concern about lifting the visa requirements might, in fact, uh, could potentially cause a bit of concern uh, on the American side about Canada's uh, immigration and, and, and security measures for people coming into the country and that that might in fact result in the thickening of the border. Uh, what are your thoughts on that? I don't anticipate that's the case. None of these issues are issues that we can't manage if there's goodwill to do it. Uh, it's all a question of organization at the end of the day. Obviously we don't want people who are abusing, uh, transiting through Canada to get into the United States. We don't want people abusing our refugee programs. We don't want uh, issues related to security and so on. All of that is manageable, but what we shouldn't be doing with our third largest trading partner is putting that sort of an impediment in the way. How did, when you, when you talk about, uh, and people have acknowledged it's an irritant, uh, what kind of an irritant was it? How did that sort of manifest itself for, for your members, uh, having those visa requirements? Well, it, 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 in a couple of different ways. The first is that it cut tourism by Mexicans coming to Canada. And it also meant that Mexican business people were less likely to come. And then secondly, that, that just simply going the other way was a, was a concern. The Mexican government particularly targeted people traveling on diplomatic passports from Canada. And uh, that itself just created the sort of tit-for-tat reaction, created uh, a, a problem and friction in the bilateral relationship, which simply didn't have to be there. Let me talk to you about uh what do you want to hear the North American leaders say in response to, to the Brexit vote uh, about where they stand on the importance of, of working together, uh, getting along together and on, on, on free trade and free trade deals? What, what I want to see is a very clear statement that we're determined to move ahead with working together in the North American continent. That a time when, if, if you take a look at the WTO and the Doha round, it's becalmed, it's going nowhere. You look at TPP, we don't know where that's going to go. Uh, because of the U.S. Congress in this instance and because of who may be president. Uh, you then look at the Brexit vote and time after time we're finding people turning inward and you know, turning away from the rest of the world, building walls. It's exactly the wrong way to go. We are very fortunate to have NAFTA and for those three leaders to get together to send a common message that, we, that we're committed to working together and deepening the relationship is I think a very positive message. Why do you think it is that parts of the world are, are turning in and, and, and looking to be, in some cases, more protectionist? I, I, I think it's a political phenomenon we're seeing globally that, that people, first of all, are feeling uh, jarred by changes that have taken place geopolitically and economically. And it's often ordinary working people who don't feel that they're getting ahead and they feel globalization is maybe to blame for that. Uh, unfortunately, by taking measures which build walls, which cut trade, which reduce people's dealings with one another, it has exactly the other effect and it makes us all weaker. You know, if, if there's a country that we have a disagreement with, South Africa on, on apartheid, for example, you impose a trade embargo because it's going to damage the economy of the, com of the country involved. And it brings political pressure. When we put trade barriers in the way of doing business with each other, we do the same thing to ourselves. We impose a trade embargo on ourselves and we make ourselves weaker in the process. It's self-defeating. What, uh, what can the three amigos, as we've come to know them, what can they commit to in concrete terms to demonstrate, you believe, uh, their, their desire for a deeper cooperation and, and deeper integration? Well, I think a, a first start is reaffirming the importance of NAFTA itself and looking for ways to ensure that NAFTA continues to function well. So uh, where we can find regulatory harmonization, where we don't have artificial barriers as a result of the so-called tyranny of small differences in regulations. Uh, if we look at transportation and infrastructure, are there ways in which we can improve the movement of people and goods in North America? Uh, when we look at uh, issues uh, related to security, how can we ensure that we manage the security of North America in a way that's efficient and effective at the same time? Uh, the environment is obviously a place where pollution doesn't stop at, at national boundaries. We need to collaborate with each other on that. 
Uh, we can look at how we deepen our, our value chains that we've developed in North America, where we have a, our industries have become deeply integrated. How do we work more efficiently together to ensure that we can compete with the rest of the world? It's a whole range of areas where it makes sense for three mature countries, each other's largest trading partners, to work together to try to ensure the prosperity of everybody. You've talked about the, the environment and, and climate change and a, and a clean growth economy. Um, what's the trade infrastructure piece that you believe that the leaders can't overlook as they talk about these other important issues? Well, I think the important thing, certainly in Canada, is that we have to look at the investment we're making in infrastructure and to give to, to uh, trade infrastructure that allows us to move our goods and our people into global markets and to be able to receive products and people coming in. Do you think that's, that's being overlooked right now? Yep. yep. In terms of the priority that's being given in the current infrastructure program in Canada, uh, this has to be given an equal priority. And instead, we've been focusing on a range of other areas, all of which are important. That includes social infrastructure. But where we're borrowing the money that's going into infrastructure spending, we need to look at every single dollar and say, is this something where we're paying for today's groceries, or is it an investment that's going to encourage economic growth in the future? When we rebuild our ports and our airports, the access roads going to them, uh, border crossings and the like, all of this has economic impacts that are very positive for Canada. And it's an investment on which you get a genuine return. Let me finish up here. I just want to come back to Brexit for a moment and, and, and the consequences. The trade minister in this country is uh, suggesting that Canada, uh, Europe free trade deal still on track, uh, even though we know Britain's scheduled to pull out of the EU now. Uh, do you share that same confidence that, uh, and, and, if, and what does Brexit mean for so those Canadian companies, many of uh, than the EU represent that have expanded into the EU through Britain in anticipation of this deal. We're all feeling our way along and all of those companies right now are looking at what the implications are for them. I think for the vast majority of people the Brexit vote was a surprise. Most people expected that, that the British at the end of the day would look at it and stay in the EU. Now it's a step backward, there's no question about that. How serious it is we'll only know over time. Uh, we don't know what the implications will be for the United Kingdom itself and its stability. Uh, we don't know. It clearly will be adding pressures on the European Union itself and uh, there will be other movements in other countries looking to break apart. As it relates to, to uh, CETA, our agreement with Europe, uh, this is an opportunity for us to go to the Europeans and say CETA, which is a negotiated agreement that both sides have agreed upon, uh, provides an opportunity if we ratify it quickly to demonstrate that the EU is still in business. Right. And that's an important message, I believe, for, for the Europeans to be able to send. It was Henry Kissinger who once said, uh, when you want to talk to Europe, who do you call? Uh, what we need to be able to demonstrate now is that Europe speaks with one voice and that you can do business with them. CETA is a great opportunity for them to send that message. All right. Uh, lots, to, lots to cover, lots to watch for uh, in the summit tomorrow. And as always, thanks for your time, Perrin Beattie. Thanks for having me.